I was trained to talk this close into the microphone. This is not going to ruin everybody's day. Can you guys hear me better now? Of course. Um, I'm a mouth breather, so you're going to get a lot of uh, breathing. <clears throat> Forget the table. What am I doing? Signings here? Signings are for losers. Let's lose the table. Come up and yeah. join me. Let's no, lose no, 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 no. You don't, yeah, well, you know. Yeah. Come on. Let's, we'll move it back. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, I'll move it back. How is everyone? Wonderful. Give it up again, John Hader. Are you calling me John Hader? No. Because no. that's Hader. my nickname. With, um, <laughs> Sorry. My, uh, Hader. Hader. My buddies will call, call me Hader sometimes because <laughs> when we watch movies, I feel like I hate on everything, which is not, it's weird because I'm such a loving person and I, I'm, I'm positive and I love movies. You know, most actors that you think, but I love movies. And then, but then I watch stuff and I'm like, this is so stupid. I was like, this could be better. It's always like, do you guys feel the same way when you watch something? For me, every time I watch it, I'm like, I start thinking, okay, you know what would make this movie better? And then it's, it's like, start thinking of everything. Um, like Napoleon could have been so much better. There's a scene, there's this dance scene that could have been so much better if he had just practiced a little bit more. Sorry, I don't mean to take over. Um, no, this is your time. No, go, no, no, go. no. Um, off Teal over there would like to uh, say a few things. It's like Gosh. a muted teal, right? Yeah, like a, like a, a yeah. peacock teal. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. How do I follow that? I just got to ask real quick. The Napoleon Dynamite was based on a short movie uh, called Palooza. And you were yes. in this. Yeah. How did, that become, how did that become a full feature? Um. I don't know why I'm sitting. It is, it's nice to stand as if I've not been standing all day. Let's lose the chairs. Um, no, 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 no. I, you never know if I need to, like, Kevin. Um, oh, my jokes aren't working tonight. I can't remember his um, Guy from uh, the dance. I can't think. Nine degrees of Kevin Bacon. If I want to Kevin Bacon that thing, whatever. Okay. Hey, Luca, the short film. Yeah, we did that. How did it become? How did it become? Uh, we a made that length? movie. How did it uh, become a full length? Okay, so yes, you're getting to the very beginning. Are we here for mostly Napoleon? Nobody cares about pickle and peanut, right? Lays of glory, blades of glory, no, blades of no. glory. I said pickle and peanut. <laughs> blades of glory is about two idiots who try to do cool stuff. Pickle and peanut is, well, it's two idiots who like try to do. So That's pretty much my most of my movies are two idiots. Although Blades of Glory was great because I finally got to play an idiot who was good at something, like Olympic level good, right? Um, so it all started with Pay Luca. Oh, by the way, Pick on Peanut Drop. That's Disney XD. You can see it on the Disney Plus app. It's pretty sweet. It's the best thing I've ever done since Napoleon that nobody's ever heard of. But it's awesome. If you don't know it, check it out there. I've done with my promotional work. Disney, yes, you guys don't have to be listening anymore. Okay. Um, so Pay Luca started in 2001. This whole Napoleon journey started 2001. Holy cow, that was a long time ago. Um, it feels like yesterday when I got the call. Uh, so me and the filmmakers, uh, Jared Hess, who wrote and directed the uh, Napoleon Dynamite, He's, he, this all came from him. This is his baby. He grew up in Preston, Idaho, where we, the movie takes place. That's where we shot the movie. This is like an autobiography of his, really. He was just like, I want to, he was a filmmaker. We were both in the film uh, school at BYU in Utah, uh, just a couple hours away from Preston. And he was like, I want to make a movie about, well, he did the short film first. And that was a school project. And when he came to me, he was like, dude, John, I, I want you to, I think you could do this. And I had only like acted in like one other student film. And I was kind of a doofus in that. So I think he was just like, well, let's get him. Because little known fact, a, he was originally going to cast the real deal. So there was this kid who was like the younger brother of one of our student friends he was like, dude, have you met Brandon's younger brother? I think his name was like Justin or something. I was like, no. He was like, 
just wait. <laughs> so I ended up meeting, but he told me the whole story. It was like, I was going to have him play the lead role of Seth w- later on to become Napoleon. But in the short film, his name is Seth. Uh, and if that had gone well, he probably would have had that kid play Napoleon. Uh, and then later on, I met the kid and he was like, he could he, he didn't cast him because he was like, I need someone to like play. He wanted him to be himself because this kid was really like the real <laughs> like deal. And he wasn't, he didn't have the curly hair or anything like that, but he was weird and he just kind of walks around like this. And he had, I just remember when I met him, he had this Gatorade bottle attached to like a string that went around. So it was like a neck, a Gatorade necklace. And he was just like walking around like this with his hand. It's like, I'm like, hey, are you Brandon's brother? He's like, yes. And I'm kind of like looking at Jared the whole time because we it was on his set. And he's like, yeah. <laughs> and so that, when I saw that moment, that's how that made it into the movie. I was like, Jared, we got to put that in the movie. Um, but so, yes, that's how Pay Lucas. So he originally was going to cast that kid. He was going to have me play the bully kid in the short film, like who's like, you know, like knocking him around or something. Anyways, that didn't, the kid couldn't act like himself. So then he's like, all right, John, you might work out. Let's just get you to play the crusty butt nugget. Um, so yeah, that's what we did. We, um, uh, we, uh, the second I read the script, I was just like, I, I know this guy. I know this guy. I was so happy. I was, we were a hundred percent on the same page I was like, every line, I was like, I can hear him. So Jared would kind of do his version. Like, this is when we were workshopping it. And then really when the character was born was when we went to the local thrift store and we started looking for clothing that Napoleon would wear. Like, he would, some acid wash jeans. And we found this really sweet uh, dragon T-shirt. And I was like, yeah. And then his wife, Jared's wife, who co-wrote the film, She's like, what if we gave you a, how do you feel about getting a perm? <laughs> now, at the time, I was single. And my, my lady game was very low. And I was like, this is not going to help that game at all. And, but this all, this inner monologue lasted all of one, like a millisecond. Because then I was like, well, dude, what other student is going to do this for a student production, put in that kind of sacrifice, I'm in. And I think it paid off because, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. No, it was, I actually will say the, the perm for the short film is way better than the perm for the feature. Go watch the short film. It looks like, like authentic pubes on my head. It is amazing. My good friend was she was a hairstylist and she's the one who did my hair for the short she had moved away and by the time we did the feature she was gone i was like what are we gonna do i was like well let's just get another student hairdresser they ended up doing it but it was like loose curls it didn't look good there's actually a couple scenes in the movie that have the original perm but then we re-permed it if you've ever tried to perm a perm it's yeah it's bad it was like so then, because they did that, he was like, the hairstylist was worried my hair was going to fall out. Because it like, it's like all these chemicals, and it like burns your hair, it burns your scalp. And he was like, so we didn't wash my hair. We washed my hair once during the entire filming. Because he, he was like, well, for one, authenticity. <laughs> and two, we don't want your hair to fall out. <laughs> so I was like, sweet. I remember the one time when he like massage it. That's when I discovered tea tree oil. It was a blessing. Um, but I think that's also explains that weird, um, spider web coming out of my hair in that one scene. Do you guys remember that? Where who here has seen Napoleon? I don't even know if you're just resting during the comic con. <laughs> Maybe you're just like tired. Um, but there's a scene where it's like, you got like three feet of air that time. And he's watching Pedro take jumps off the, thing and you can see that long strand does anybody know what i'm talking about i think that was a real i think that was charlotte like fleeing my gross head it's like i'm out of here so she's like Woo! which by the way funny thing efren ramirez ramirez who plays pedro 
he really did think after shooting that his scene jumping off the thing he was like dude i got some sweet air we're like dude you, you did not and we showed him playback or when he finally saw the movie he was like oh i thought that was really sweet um that was the longest answer to that first question um but yeah that's really kind of how it all started with we did that it was two days shoot in Preston. We had like the these two kids. It was just me and then these two Hispanic kids who were locals at that high school who played Pedro and Gail. And they were kind of a uh, in the movie. We put those two ki- t- uh, characters together just to make Pedro. Uh, but that was it. Like I the um, well, you'd have to see the short. You know, go watch the short. It's amazing. It's awesome. But yeah, that was the beginning of it all. So when, after the short, Jared said, dude, do you want to do like a feature version of this? Like in a summer or two? I'm like, yeah, I got nothing else better to do. I was like, that sounds sweet. And I was actually very excited for it. Because I was like, he started telling me about some of the characters. I mean, we that was in 2001 we shot it. And we shot the movie in, two, in the summer of 2003. So all that time, I just got little, you know, hints and little inside looks. He's like, dude, I got this Uncle Rico guy. He's like the shady, weird guy. But the best, he's like, your brother is going to be so rad kip. He rides around on rollerblades. He thinks he's awesome, but he's not. And he's got like, he's just this sick little mustache. He was like, everyone in the film's got mustaches except for you. I'm like, oh, okay. Um, But uh, I was super excited to see all these other characters that were not yet in Napoleon's world. Um, so, yeah, that's that's how this all started. But yeah. so rarely a student film becomes a feature. I mean, did someone from a large studio see it, or how did the money happen to, to get there to make the feature? Um, that's a great question, off teal. Um, <laughs> what a... Hater. <laughs> Hater. No, 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 lover this right, time. Gotcha. Lover. Uh, so, yeah, with a student film... He was getting ready to make he okay, so we were both friends with this uh other guy who was in the film program with us in production classes. They we all kind of knew each other, and he had a rich brother. Remember one eight hundred contacts? <laughs> so his brother it started that. He made that. So he had some good cash flow. And Jared knew that, and he basically told Jared they were he was friends with Jared, and he was like, dude. Do you ever need, like, I'm here for you. I could probably hit my brother up for some money. So he's like, yeah, let's do it. And it was kind of all planned. I mean, they went through the right things, but it was all independently financed by one guy. And he went to his brother and he says, and his brother was like, yeah, I knew this day would come. I knew you were in film. I knew you'd probably come asking for money. He's like, and that's fine. If it makes it, if it makes money, great for me. If it doesn't, I'm not going to be upset, but don't ask me for money again. Uh, he ended up doing fine. <laughs> uh, he made some money. Um, so you just get the funding. I mean, if you have the money, then you just need the talent, and hopefully you have the talent. When we shot the film, it was all the crew was all just students. It was like a, a glorified student film. But we had we shot it during the summer when school was not in session, because we were like, well, otherwise we got to get back to class. Um, so yeah, we shot it. We all just caravaned up there. We it was like a big uh, summer camp. We everybody, most of the crew stayed in like houses or basements of family and friends of the director who lived there in town. And then the cast, we were treated the best and stayed at the Plaza Motel. Motel. That's when I, I didn't know what the difference was between a motel and hotel was until I shot Napoleon. I was like, oh, okay, this is one. A motel is a, 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 is a place where the walls bend, you know? The wooden walls can, like, you can just push it in, and it just warps. Um, but, yeah, we we all stayed up there, and, um, and yeah, it was, it was great. We, had, like, the student, we were all in on it. We had all met, worked or knew about the short film. Um, and so everybody was just like, dude, I think we're going to make something pretty cool. And the best part is like all the talent, all the other actors that we got 
Everybody did it. You knew they were there not for the money. They were not there for the money because there was no money. They were there because they loved the script. I mean, John Grice, Uncle Rico, Efren Ramirez, Pedro, all of them will tell you like, and, and John Grice, who played Uncle Rico, amazing. And he had been working. He'd done so many projects before then. And his, his agents were like, this is nothing. Like, you know, you can do this or not. They don't have any money. But he read it and he loved it. And so everybody there was on the same page. The, all these student crew guys who I was friends with and then all these Hollywood guys were like, yeah, no, we're all in it. There's no egos on set. We had no studios attached. We had no financiers, really. We could do whatever we wanted um, under the constraints of time and budget. So we shot it in 22 days. Um, and yeah. And then, and then, yes, to answer the rest of your question, we were like, well, and, and what, that's what I thought when we made the movie. I was like, I don't know if this is great, and I think it's great, and I think it could have an audience, but with independent films, you don't know if it's ever going to be seen by anybody. Like back then, exposure was still kind of like we, we had internet. Yes, it was not that long ago, but we didn't have social media really. I mean, Facebook was just kind of barely coming out, and we were just like, well, I mean, I don't know how, you know, word of mouth is going to work, and we'll probably get in a few festivals. It's probably that kind of a film. Well, we got luckily into Sundance, which if you don't know what Sundance is, it's like the premier independent film festival to get a film in. You have all eyes and ears there. All of Hollywood is there checking it out. And we got in because I think we knew a guy who knew a guy who was a programmer at Sundance. And so they just was a, he was able to put it at the top of the list for it to check out. Sundance saw it, and they're like, this is so the kind of film we want to showcase. So amazingly, you know, I think the talent was there. They recognized that there was something special. So they really pushed it for us. And the first uh, screening was the first time I had seen the movie, first time anybody had seen the movie, and it was a dream come true. It was one of the greatest moments of my life. I don't even remember my first kid being born, but I remember that night. <laughs> that night was amazing. Um... I remember my first kid. Okay. So yeah, that's how we that's how we got into Sundance. And then Sundance is where uh, Fox Searchlight came and they saw it and they I mean there was a bidding war. Fox, Paramount, MTV, they all wanted to buy it and Fox won. And so then they put it out and the rest is history. You wanna get some questions from the audience? I guess. No. Oh. Why don't you head over to that side, Mike? Get a couple questions. No, I love or, it. Or not. Okay, so you, being an actor, you worked with many celebrities, and I want to know um, which celebrity in particular was the best to work with. I mean, by which celebrity, I mean Tina the Llama. Oh, you're, you mean, what did I love? You just want me to say Tina the Llama was the best I ever worked with. Yeah. I mean, I honestly think that is the opposite, the 100% the opposite. I was not a fan. You know, animals were not like my go-to on that film. The chickens, the llama, the poor cow. Um, what are the animals? There was a rat. There was like a skunk running around in the background of one of the shots. I don't know if you remember that. These are all Easter eggs that, of course, I know about. Um, but only the ardent fan would have to have a keen eye. Uh, what? A, yeah, no, Tina Lama I was kind of worried about. And she, okay, this is one of the only moments, because the film is, a lot of people ask, you know, was it, uh, there was there a lot of ad lib and improv? And no, like, everything you see in the film was there on the page. Really wasn't any moments of improv, except for in the script, Napoleon comes out and says, Tina, you fat lard, come get some dinner. Teeny fat large, just eat the food. But I think it was just come get some dinner. And so he goes out, and in the script it says he feeds Tina the llama, and, and Tina eats it. Well, she wouldn't eat the food. <laughs> so I think that's when I threw in, like, eat the food. And, like, and really, I was holding out. And I can't blame her, because her real name, by the way, is Dolly. Dolly Llama. It's not my fault, but yeah. 
And it was actually owned by the director's mom. It was her llama. Um, so when we, uh, yeah, like it was the, it was supposed to be a casserole and it was like hamburger helper, like uncooked hamburger helper, just the cream or whatever you like the uncooked, whatever gunk. And then they sprinkle breadcrumbs on top. I was dry heating when I saw it and I was holding out there and she wouldn't eat it. So that's when I was like, what am I do? And she's like, not eating. That's when I was like throwing it and stuff like that and getting TO'd. Um, yeah. So I was a little worried that she didn't like me, but I was very happy to see grandma making out with her at the end. I was like, good. She got some love. Any other questions from that side of the room? We got a couple down right here. Green shirt. <laughs> ah, there you go. <laughs> All right. Hi, John. Merry Christmas. Great to have you with us. Thank you. All right. So my biggest question for you is, what was your favorite part about working on live action projects like Blades of Glory with Will Ferrell and Jenna Fisher and animation projects like Surf's Up as Chicken Joe? All great movies, by the way. Thank you. I'm so glad that works out nicely that you're here and you're fans of those. Um, the uh, I love doing it all. I, I get that. I get asked that a lot. You know, live action, animation, live action. You just it's a little bit of both. You live action. You get to be in character, dressing up, getting into the hair and makeup. I mean, doing Napoleon was like. It's it's the one movie I could truly watch where I'm just like I don't I don't get embarrassed I don't get weird or awkward watching myself I just like yeah that's like a different person I'm like getting into that slipping on the moon boots is like slipping on another skin you know um, and it's just so fun that way and and working with the actors in person and obviously there's so much to be gained from that doing voiceover you can just you just go in your holy sweats and you're just like a bum i mean you just like w w show up to the studio and you don't see anybody else and it's easier but it's also like you're creating this character you get to see it and uh, and pickle and peanut one of the best um was one of the funnest projects i ever worked on i love doing the voiceover stuff because it is it's so different but weirdly the two big animated films that i did um monster house if you haven't seen that i'm in that one and Surf's Up, both of those were not your typical voiceover. Monster House was motion capture, so that's where we wore the suits with the little d reflective dots, and everything you see the characters doing in the cartoon is actually us. And a funny side note, I have like two scenes in the film. I'm a fat pizza delivery guy, and I broke my foot doing the, the mocap because I have... I had these weird shoes you're wearing on. I was running and there's these cables. You're running over all these cables and I just rolled my foot and you can hear. <coughs> um, so I got to tell people, yeah, I broke my foot doing animation. I was an idiot. Um, so it's still dangerous. Okay. Uh, and then, and then Surf's Up, which was really fun. And for those who have seen it, it was supposed to be, it was one of the first animated films that felt like a mockumentary, uh, documentary in style. And so we were actually there in the same room with the other actors. Normally, you're separated, doing your separate lines, but they wanted to get this improv feel, so we would just work off each other and kind of talk back and forth. Uh, this was Shia before he went crazy. Um, and, uh, and, and so it was awesome. Um, it, it, was, it was so great to do it that way. So I got to do a lot of experimental stuff with animated films. So I love it all. Great question. All right. Oh, just a second, young man. Oh, that, that's awesome. You said earlier about like practicing the dance scene. How much time? Did... <laughs> How much time did you actually have to practice that dance scene? Like, was that choreographed or was that just you? Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, the, that, quick answer. Like, it was there was no practice. It was all freestyle. Well, that is the only answer. Um, I hate saying that because it sounds like a brag, even though that I know it is. Um, yeah, it was just easier because I like to dance, and Jared was like, I know you like to dance. I'm going to make it the climax of the film. I'm like, oh, shoot. Oh, okay, so what do I do? And he was like, well, just do your thing. What do you do? I was like, well, I mean, I'm not a choreographer. I just... I just put on music and I'll dance and feel it. 
He was like, then just do that. I was like, okay. So, yeah, we, uh, Tina Majorino, who plays Deb, she was a hip hop instructor at the time, kind of like a little side thing she would do. So, her and I went the night before into Rex Kwando's studio um, because it was nearby and had all those sweet mirrors. And so we practiced just the first two, like the first two eight counts for all you dancers out there, where he's just like sitting there, you know. And then we got to come up with a term for what this is, you know. Like I was thinking, it's like my own personal man spreading or something like that. I don't know, but it basically right before I pop it, that's that was planned, and then the rest of it was just like whatever my body threw up. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm gonna let him do the work this time, ma'am. <laughs> that's what I, that's what I get paid the big bucks for. Um, I have to ask, where did Napoleon's voice come from? Is that something you always kind of did as like a joke voice and you know, you thought this would be perfect for it or? It's really when I'm just not in front of an audience, it's like, it's my, it's my, my resting my RBV, my resting like butt voice. Uh, no, seriously, like if I'm at home and I'm just like, you guys are idiots. Uh, I know when I do remember, it was, yeah, it was just an exaggerated version of myself and my younger brothers. When I read the original short film script, I, I mean, I heard it. Jared kind of did his version of him. I was like, yes, dude, this is like, we both had younger brothers, and that's really where Napoleon was born out of. The younger brothers always thinking like everybody's taking a dump on them. And they're just like, oh, why is this so stupid? And then, oh, you guys are ruining my life. And, and they're getting mad over dumb things like quit eating all our steak and ruining all our lives. Like eating steak is more worse than ruining your life. Um, and so, yeah, it's just like, it was more relaxing, you know, it's easy, like, just... <sighs> it was kind of therapeutic, because I could, like, close my eyes whenever I want to, and, and nobody... And Jared was like, perfect, perfect, but yeah. I was so used to, after that, you know, directors going, like, we need to see your eyes. Open your eyes. I was like, this is just how it is, because it's always bright outside. I'm like... Who's next? Tie-dye. Sorry. You got my butt, so that's enough. No. How do you feel when your emo got into Fortnite? When my emo? My emotion? What, emo? Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I don't speak the young kid talk. I'm just kidding. I like to pretend I don't know what you're talking about. Um, how did it get into Fortnite? Easy. Just copyright infringement. <laughs> They stole it, and they called it something groove so that they wouldn't have to put it we, we went through an interesting, like, I was like, can you, like, copyright dance moves? I don't know. I probably stole all my moves from someone else, so I didn't care. Um, I don't know how it got in. Like, someone was just like, let's do some cool, like, famous dances that people do, but only do 15 seconds of it so that we can't get sued. But that's okay. I don't know. It brought it to another generation, even though it wasn't credited. So they're probably like, hey, look, when they finally see the movie, they're like, hey, he's copying Fortnite. <laughs> and that's when I'm like, it's popular again? Yeah. What, the movie or Fortnite? The dance. the dance. Yeah, it's popular again? Yeah. This is like resurgence in popularity? Yeah. What is it making the rounds on TikTok? Yeah. Or is that what they call it? TikTok, right? Yeah. yeah. See, once again, I'm pretending like I don't know. <laughs> Although, I really did struggle for a long time about Snapchat. I did not get that. I still don't even know what TikTok really is. Um, but, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I think I answered that. Yeah. Groovy, what do you want? Okay, we got one here. Oh, never mind, Groovy. Oh, oh. Okay. Um, I heard, read on the internet when you were talking about steak earlier that one take... Uncle Rico got you in the face with the steak, and that's all it took, and you had, like, broke the glasses, broken nose, stuff like that. Is that true? Well, um, the way that went down is yes, y yes, kind of. 
It took a number. So most of the takes of the film were really basically three takes. We wouldn't have enough time, and that was all it really took. Everybody kind of knew what they were doing. You're locked into that character. Everybody was pro. Uh, when we started shooting that scene, the gag is that, you know, Uncle Rico hits him with a stake, right? So, A, first of all, norm on a normal film, you would have a special effects wrangler who would have, like, a cannon, you know, who's that's hooked up to an air hose and shooting these fake foam things that you they would never throw real meat at someone but again we're like this movie is all about authenticity the what you see on the screen is pretty much as it is that's the answer to most of the questions here what you see is everything is as it seems okay so yeah Uncle Rico, though, John Grice is like, no, I'm the one throwing this, okay? So I'm doing it. So he's like throwing it. He's kind of lobbing it. He's trying to lead me into it, or I'm trying to lead into it. And it's a hard shot because I'm on a bike, and he's throwing the stake. And they've only got a couple stakes, so I, each time they're like dusting it off. Or, And at one time, it bounces off my head. So he's missing me, and finally, you know, Jared's like, Ooh, we're running out of daylight or film, what if we push the camera in closer, then it's easier to get the shot. And that's John Grice in true Uncle Rico fashion was like, no, 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 man. I can hit him. You're going to kill the joke if you, if you pull in. I can hit him, but I'm going to need a bigger piece of meat. And I got to really be able to chuck that. You got to let me really throw it. And that's when I was like, well, then, then throw it, you turd. So... They got him a full-on, like, steak, because before it was, like, a little prime, tiny prime rib, or I, I don't know what you call them, the filet mignon. Um, so, yeah, he got a big, they got him a big steak, <laughs> and again, in Uncle Rico fashion, there was this behind-the-scenes guy next to him, and he goes, and he points at him, he's like, you watch this, <laughs> and that was the take. Like he's just, and he, so he really actually in real life, he plays baseball. So he's got a good throwing arm. He's not so much, I mean, you know, football's whatever, but baseball, he's good. So he chucked that and it smacked me so hard. They didn't use sound effects. That was the sound <laughs> of the steak hitting my face. It knocked my glasses off. I got a little blood. It ripped my skin and and he was so happy, but he was just like, almost ran into, you know, into the, into the frame. Uh, Pedro, uh, Efren, Pedro, he's supposed to stay there in the scene. But if you remember in the scene, like he like, kind of like gets on the bike and walks, runs off because he was going to lose it. So he just left the scene. I was like, I was almost like, wait, you can't do that. That's, that's not how acting works. If something doesn't work, you can't just leave a scene. But he did, and uh, and you know it wasn't hard to stay in character because it really freaking hurt, and I was just like, oh, oh, what, what? I was like, you idiot, and um, yeah, there. Okay, who's Groovy? Groovy is right here, finally. Right here. Yep. My, fa my favorite scene from Napoleon is Tina, come get some ham. But my, uh, I had a question was, uh, how was it working with Billy Bob? Billy Bob Thornton, he was great. Real Southern gentleman, you know? Like, he knows how to tell a good story, and he's so, like, g like genuine with the cast and the crew. But then he would show up, like, two hours late to set. So, you know, he was a real bastard. Um, he was really awesome to work with. It was like, and if you're a fan of uh, Sling Blade, we did a behind-the-scenes scene. It's probably on the internet somewhere where I was playing Napoleon, and he was playing Carl from Sling Blade, and we were talking about taters and tots and comparing taters and tots. It's pretty magical. I was like, no way, you got that? He's like, or sort of whatever his thing is. Uh, but he was awesome. I loved him. Okay, back over here. Yeah. Do you really love tater tots? I do like tots. Everything on screen is as it seems. And it makes it a little tough when I go to a restaurant and they're like, I'm like, and, and can I have the tots? And they're like, like, just give me the tots. I don't even say tots. I say like these um, 
uh, fried a potato a nuggets. And they're like, you mean tots? I was like, sure, whatever. Uh, but yeah, tots are delicious. Yeah. I think pretty much everything is as it seems, except that I smile in real life. It's about the only difference. Got time for about two more questions? Is two that more. Cool? No, no. Oh, okay, okay. All right. Yeah, wait. Did I say? Oh, yeah. Hey, 70s guy. Uh, we have all waited a billion years now, it seems like. Are we ever going to see Napoleon again in something original on screen? Please. <sighs> well, there's no official statement right now. I mean, okay, like you guys are the convention going people, all right? You're a special breed. This is like sometimes we have to look to you as trendsetters or really the, the ones who are like, okay, I'm sacrificing my awesome Saturday or Friday weekend to go hang out and just buy nerdy stuff, okay? So it's you we have to actually truly ask, would you want, would you want a Napoleon sequel? <laughs> All right. Call Hollywood. Um, um, you don't think it would be ruined? Like, okay, I mean, look, I mean, look, the track record for most of these old cult films, getting a sequel or reboot is, uh, I mean, <sighs> Dumb and Dumber, I still haven't even seen that one. Bad Santa, I haven't seen that one, but I didn't hear good things about any of the six. I know, now we're getting into what I'm talking about, the hating. Um, I, would, I, I would personally would love to do more Napoleon stuff. I would love to. I don't think the book of Napoleon is closed forever. I honestly think there's going to be something, whether it's a sequel or a TV show or another animated. Did you guys see the animated series? Yeah, it's pretty good. That's like your sequel right there. I mean, it's six episodes. You watch it back to back. It's about two hours. Um, yeah, it's like a movie. We had the original cast back. It was awesome. But, I mean, it just kind of goes to show because we had that film, I mean, that show, it means that there's more out there I honestly think you could do. And now that Fox Properties is owned by Disney, we know how Disney feels about cashing in on everything that's ever been made so you never know maybe uh maybe we'll be back I don't, I don't know but you know i i don't think i honestly don't think it's dead there's got to be something i think though if the, in my personal opinion if there was a napoleon sequel it would have to be real time we wouldn't do like oh it's senior year and it's a bunch of 40 year olds trying to pretend that they're <laughs> still in high school um, but real time, I will say this though, it, just prepare yourselves. If it was coming from me, I don't know how much they're going to listen to me, but if it's coming from me, prepare yourselves. It's going to be dark because well, Oh yeah, you're happy. Okay. Well, there's, yeah. I mean, part of the charm of Napoleon is the innocence of youth, right? I mean, they're in high school. They don't have any real responsibility or accountability that much. It's all the coming of age. They can get away with all kinds of stuff. They can throw action figures out the window and drag it for half a mile. Nobody cares. Of course, if you do it as a 45-year-old, then the cops are like, we got a weirdo uh, right in the school bus. I, I think Napoleon today would be very like, he's entered the workforce. He has got responsibility. He's paying for like, maybe one or two alimonies, child support for one of them. But it's great because it also gives our hero a very low place to start. and He's got to work himself. He's got to win back Deb, right, maybe. And he's got to save Uncle Rico from prison. Um, and, you know, and Kip is actually roided out from cage fighting. He really saw his dreams. So Napoleon and Kip are, like, getting there, and Kip is just, like, tearing people up. Um, so yeah, I don't know. There's something there. <laughs> it's going to be black and white. Okay. Uh, and it's going to take place during winter when everything's just bleak and just like sad. So just prepare yourselves mentally. Mm -hmm. I also had a dream the other night, no joke that I was just like, I had a, an inspiration. I was like, what if it's a weird meta thing that they do nowadays where Napoleon in real time, and Pedro get the time machine to work, 
and they go back to like that time, 2004, and they're dealing with like their old, I don't know, something. But I feel like there's got to be something with the time machine because I will say this. I have, for those hardcore fans, an identical twin brother. Efren Ramirez, who plays Pedro, also has an identical twin brother. So we could do like the, and, and both of them, both our twins are like kind of like the five-year-old or sadder, grosser version of ourselves now. <laughs> so we could do like, oh, Napoleon and Pedro meet their future selves five years in the future. And it's not looking great. <laughs> um, anyways, yeah. Okay, I think uh, we only got a little bit left. About well, then, five minutes. Uh, do we have time for one more question? Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. For you? Hell yeah. Okay. Who's, who thinks they have the best last question? Oh, she did not have confidence. She put her hand up. She looks confident. I'm sorry, ma'am, but this Good better luck. be freaking good. Yes, right. I'm looking at you, hoodie. Yes. Yep. Head out, to the, head out to the aisle. Oh, she's coming out here. Yeah. Okay. She speaks for all. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Now I can. Where did Clark come from in Benchwarmers? Okay, Benchwarmers. We haven't idea? covered Benchwarmers. Well done. Uh, that, that said, Clark, where did he come from? His, mo his mom's womb? <laughs> um, uh, actually, interesting thing. When they wrote that script, so this was an Adam Sandler production. His production company made that one. And... I think that script had actually been hanging around for a bit. It happens a lot in Hollywood. Someone will write something. It's an easy, you could honestly see like a trio of lots of different comedic actors, you know, in that spot. But because he was making that, I think he originally, they were planning it on, this is what I heard. It was uh, like Rob Schneider, David Spade, and Chris Farley uh, was originally, I think, going to be one of the bit. I mean, this is what they pictured like a decade or so before, we did it. So I was just like, I can't fill those shoes. But I think that's kind of how he was originally conceived a little bit. Um, yeah, I don't know. Like when I, yeah, when I read it, I was just like, yeah, okay, I could do this. A guy who's no good at something. Um, and all the nose picking stuff was more of, you know, some of my own ideas. <laughs> so stupid. And the helmet was also my idea as well. I was just like, you know those dweebs who, you know, ride bikes, couriers who don't even bother taking off their, their uh, helmets and their knee pads when they go into a store shopping? Let's do that. <laughs> and so they're like, great idea. Let's keep it on you for the entire film. I was like, well, that's kind of like uh, extreme. I didn't think he was going to do that the whole time, but whatever. Let's do it. So, yeah. Good question. Good question. Is that it? Are we done, or well, do we have time? I got, I got, uh, I got a, a track. I got the song you wanted. Well, you can end it. No, you can end it on that as people are getting up and leaving. Or are you guys sticking around for uh, who's next? Steve Byrne. Oh, that's a good warm-up audience. <laughs> Just telling you. I mean, yeah. You know, we're okay. both come from innocent places, right? Unless Steve Byrne gets up and plays some sad, like, emo rock that he wrote over the last <laughs> couple decades. <laughs> Steve, I love you, wherever you are, man. <laughs> Yes. Thank you guys so much for oh. coming out. I love you. This is always awesome. Up. I'll be Get here her. tomorrow and maybe Sunday when I should be at church and so should you. But that's not doing a good job of selling this con. So come, sin a little bit, and then go back to church. Give it up. He'll be headed back to his table. Hi, this is Aaron Ashmore, and you are watching Phantom Spotlight. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe like like now. Oh, and have fun and follow your fandom.